It is just a huge honor today to be sitting in the podcast studio with Dr. Stephen Heimovich in my own backyard. We both, I've been a big fan of yours for 30 years. I mean, uh, you, you, uh, let me read his bio. So Dr. Stephen, he goes by Dr. H, or everybody calls him around town Dr. H. Dr. Heimovich, DDS. We both have an MBA from Arizona State University, go ASU. And he has CEC, a certified executive coach. Over his career, he has developed and expanded more than 20 dental offices. His current Tucson and Phoenix-based dental specialty practice, Valley Endodontic Neural Surgery, consists of 10 offices, making it the largest endodontic oral surgery practice in the southwestern United States. In 2017, him and his wife, Julie, co-founded the Scottsdale Leadership and Coaching Center, where they develop and enhance individuals and teams aspiring to lead others effectively through various facets of leadership training. Um, I've Twice I've posted his book, uh, The Dentist Who Gets It, The No BS Blueprint for Success by Endodontist Steve Heimovich on Amazon. The Dentist Who Gets It is a book for those in specialty healthcare healthcare or business in general who are looking for momentum in their business and life, Dr. H looks past quick fixes to putting the time in for success. He guides readers to a path where they can marry their head and heart to be successful both professionally and personally. This book fills a void for those in healthcare that set off in an uphill battle for success after graduate school, daunted by debt and lacking business acumen. Dr. H is a self-made man, shares his tried and true methods for success from keeping pace with the latest healthcare trends to leading in today's environment to managing balance sheets to selling a practice for a profit, using self-deprecating and smart humor, The Dentist Who Gets It is an enjoyable read that helps readers figure out where they are and want to go. I can't tell you um, what an honor it is that you drove all the way uh, from, uh, Scott. where'd you drive from? I drove uh, from was, Scottsdale. That was from like Scottsdale? A- so I hope you, whenever they come visit me in Phoenix, they always have to pack a gun. Did you have to pack a uh, are, are you carrying today when you come visit me in Phoenix? I'm carrying some extra weight, but not a gun. <laughs> um, so your book is on Amazon. That's, th- th- we have so much in common. We're both dentists. We both got an ASU MBA. And after MBA, you know, we both wrote a book. Um, I always say that I have four kids, but writing a book was, is like a child. I mean, it takes nine months to make a baby, and it takes nine months to write a book. How was your journey on writing a book? Um, it, 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 it was tough to be disciplined to just stick to it. Uh, I actually do a lot of flying uh, around the country, especially for my son's hockey tournaments. And those, I and mean, my son was in New Jersey last year, and spending the time on the plane, that's when I did my most writing, uh, but just sticking to it. And going through the edits and just reading it and reading it again, that was really tough uh, for me, but it was, I'm glad I got it done. When you said flying around the country, at first I thought you had your own plane. Then you, when you said you're writing your book, I was like, I hope you're not the pilot and writing your book at the same time. <laughs> well, that's right. What did they say? You can't fly in text, right, at the same time? Yeah. How, how's the book doing, and what, what are the major takeaways? I mean, basically, it's actually doing pretty well. It actually was, uh, Amazon had it as one of the best-selling new books that were in the dental practice management, so I was happy with that. Uh, thank you very much. I know that you sent something out there uh, a few weeks ago, and that helped. Thank you, Howard, very much. Um, some of the big takeaways are, you know, here's the thing. As you know, a lot of dentists, they come out of dental school, all they know about dental practice management is very little. And what I remember from dental practice management was one thing, the difference between leasing and purchasing equipment. That's all I knew. And as you know, that is like the one of the, Point zero zero one percent of having a successful practice. Uh, it, it's basically takeaways of things I've learned over the years, all the mistakes I've made. Actually, no, I haven't really made any mistakes. I've learned a lot of lessons. And just taking all those lessons and sort of putting them in a format that other dentists can read. Uh, things that I learned the hard way, and hopefully they'll learn without making those same mistakes. Yeah, I, I almost thought um, I had to write my book because... I mean, if you don't read, you just live your life. Mm-hmm. But every time you read auto, I was always amazed at how many amazing people, Thomas Watson Jr. of IBM, uh, the founders of Home Depot, all these guys wrote an autobiography telling you everything they learned the hard way. Like say, you, you, you fall down, it's a lesson, you get back up, successful mm-hmm. man, fall down seven times, get up eight. And uh, my gosh, all, all my heroes were pretty much 
dead guys who wrote an autobiography. And, and I, th- I think I read um, um, before I threw my library away because, you know, not, you know, um, I have done through this twice after at the end of college, you threw away all your albums because you knew it was going. I threw away two record, cr- two orange crates of albums because I knew it all go to CD. And then finally I'm sitting here in my library with all these books and I, you know, um, so I threw them away. But, you know, I, I read a thousand books, probably all in history, autobiographies, economics. And I, I, I felt it was like giving back to the next generation. And these young kids come out of school I mean, why would you want to graduate at 25 and stick your tongue in every light socket known to man when you and I have probably kissed half those light sockets and wrote a book to tell you, don't do that. This is what you got to do. But I I want to back all the way up first because I know my audience and um, podcasters, they're they're all kids. Uh, I'm a grandpa. I got my four kids made five grandbabies. I still read books. Uh, When I'm sitting on an airplane next to someone reading a Kindle, I feel sorry for them. Um, but so there, when I say, drop me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com or leave a comment in the YouTube, um, subscription, but probably a quarter of them are in dental school and the rest are all, you know, they're all 30 and under millennials. Only like one guy a month sends me an email that he's as old as me. They're saying that when you and I graduated, it was a good old days. We were lucky. We were in the right place at the right time. And now they're coming out of school, three to 400,000 in debt. The average is 283,000. And they say it's just not the same as it was. Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? I agree with that somewhat. Uh, obviously, the kids coming out now. And by the way, I don't know when I started saying that. It must have been like nine or 10 years ago, I started saying, the kids coming out. So I knew that was the time. I remember that's when I hit 45 or so. Um, But I'll be honest with you. I went through, I graduated dental school in 1988 and talking to the specialist then, that I, should I go into peri or should I go into endo? If I talked to the periodontist then, oh, it's terrible. It's so saturated now, going to endo. And then the endodontist would say going to ortho. And of course they'd always want you to go into something else. So you know what? (laughs) It never really gets easier. Uh, and I think the only, like maybe GV Black didn't complain about the competition, but I think it's always been tough. It's tougher now, but you just have to, you know, you just can't, I think the difference between now and let's say 20 years ago, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, you could put your shingle out, you know, you do good dentistry and that's good enough. Where it's changed, I think, is you have to really be learning. You can't, you can't just stay in your cave. You have to go to meetings like Dental Town. There's a lot of resources out there. You can't just sit back and let it happen. You know, you can't just let your, you can't just, you have to lead your life. You can't just wait for it to happen and just sit back and say, wow, this is really tough. Well, we have 400 online C courses at Dental Town, and we're hoping that you grace us and make us a course someday. You think you'll ever do that on Dental Town online CE? Uh, absolutely. Now, if the course is going to be on how to get ready for the next uh, marathon, like, I will not do that one, <laughs> but absolutely. I'd love I, to do that. I would love that. Millennials love it. They, they would rather sit on their iPad and take a course one hour at a time for the price of an Uber drive to a bar uh, than fly clear across the country and drop 3000 for a weekend when they're, when they're uh, um, you know, when, when they're tough. Um, when, when you talk about hang up a shingle, though, that's what I did. I, I came out here in 87 hung up a shingle. But isn't it really different being a specialist because... When you hang up your shingle, I mean, I was marketing B2C, business to consumer, trying to get the average Phoenician to come see me. But back in the day when you opened up, you were trying to get referrals from general dentists to send you their molar endo. How was, and and I'm so glad I had you on the show. I I don't think I've ever really had anybody on the show that talked to the specialists that are listening right now. That's a pretty different game. Was it a different game back then the same way it is a different game right now? It was a different game. Uh, look, as, as you know, here in Arizona, when we came out here from Canada, like, from Canada, from Montreal, yeah, the, you know. So do you speak French? Uh, with a really strong English accent. <laughs> Let's just say when I go back up to Montreal and I speak French, they'll answer me in English. I'm not, okay. I'm not trying to put one over on them. They, they have it figured out. W- were you born in Montreal? Yes. Why, so was that, so what was your native tongue? Was it French or English? English. Huh. I always think of Montreal as French. Uh, about 80% is French, but basically the west side of Montreal is mostly English and the east side is mostly French. Okay. Uh, but I do... And, and is the east side French about the same dialect as Paris? No, it's like the difference between 
you know, I was in Europe uh, last year, and if I hear a French accent from the province of Quebec, I'll know right away it's from Quebec. It's the difference between English that's spoken in England compared to the Bronx. I mean, it's, it's like night and day. Yeah. Spanish is that way. I've noticed for 30 years, my patients, um, if you're from Mexico, you think they say it right. If you're from Cuba, you think they say it right. Argentina and Chile are just outlandish. And then there's, yeah, so Spanish is... A very dialect language, you know. Absolutely. Uh, but 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 back to your but back when you opened your door, it, it was a diff- What was the game? So on number, getting Mueller Indos. So first of all, it was a lot different. There were a lot less specialists, as you know. There were no dental schools here. It really was the perfect place at the right time. Uh, but here's what's changed. It's, it's like we, what we had to say earlier on about how things are a little bit more difficult. So it used to be if your work was good, you sat back. And you were busy. But now I think the practices that thrive, they know they can't just sit back. It's not just having good work. The general dentists assume the work is good. That, that just gets you in the door. That, however, what are you doing for them? Now you have to offer CE courses. You have to do lunch and learns. You have to do that kind of extra stuff. The days of, as you said last week at your convention, just dropping off donuts and cakes, that doesn't do it anymore. I mean, they may, they may gain a couple of pounds, but they're not going to refer to you because of that. Yeah, um, it's interesting how when you said they assume the work is good, it's so bizarre to realize from the consumer's point of view that dentists, physicians, MDs, hospitals got so good, we almost became a commodity. I was looking at studies where, like, when, um, say you're 30 and your appendix ruptures and then call an ambulance and then you get your appendix removed. Everyone in the family just assumes, well, if they took you to the University Hospital McGill, I mean, they, they assume that part is perfect. And they just start focusing in on all the comfort creatures of the hospital. Did you like the staff? Did you like your doctor? Things like that. But it, it's it's so bizarre that dentistry got so good that when you're marketing the, peop, the baby boomers, as opposed to um, the baby boomers my age, I'm 56, they have had enough traumatic dentistry to know that some dentists are good, some are bad, some are painful, some aren't painful. But the millennials, they only had, you know, they had fluoridated toothpaste, fluoridated water. They just had a few fillings and cavities. They just assume all dentists are created equal. All the hospitals are created equal. So it's really um, the differentiation, the marketing differentiation to older people is fading away. And the millennials are just seeing us as a commodity that a Muller root canal is a Muller root canal is a Muller root canal. Any, anybody that does it, it'd be the same. No, absolutely. And the other thing that has changed a lot, you know, talking to a lot of dentists that refer to us, they have to know that when they send a patient over, A, they cannot be thrown underneath the bus. So, you, for example, I've heard examples like this in the past. There may be the odd time, not from any page, not that any referring dentist in Arizona that I know of. But there's times you bring a patient in, they have, uh, you know, lingering pain to cold for many, many weeks, and they have a new crown that was put on, and you ask the patient, so when did that start? Waiting for the answer to be, well, since the crown was cemented on, it started having those symptoms. And you might hear every once in a while, well, actually, it's been, it was killing me, even though I had, even when I had the temps on, it was killing me. Now, of course, in our mind, we're thinking, hmm, that wasn't too smart to have cemented on the permanent crown, but you don't say that to the patient. If you say that to the patient, it's the kiss of death. I mean, th- that happens sometimes. You want to call the, ge- the general dentist up and tell them, here, here's the situation, needs a root canal, but you have to do things. You, it's what's in it for the general dentist. If there's a patient in pain and they're, let's say, off that day, you have to see the emergency. It's not just that you get a, a puff at the end of the apex. You have to see emergencies. You have to be there for the dentist. You have to just know, you have to communicate. Those are the things that have to happen now. And maybe 20 years ago, you didn't have to do the, that extra stuff. You have to do that now or else you're dead in the water. So um, you, I mean, you, you, you built the largest endo or specialty program in the, in the Southwest. So you have marketing reps that go that market to B two B dentists or B two C consumers. No, right to the right to the general practices. So you so so 
w- w- is it all endodontics or oral surgery too? Endo and oral surgery. Endo and oral surgery. I noticed that pediatric dentists are doing so much better when they hook up with an orthodontist and make a one-stop shot. Mm-hmm. Why endo with oral surgery? Why not endo and perio? Or why 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 the endo oral surgery? How did that marriage happen? Uh, like most things that I I did, it's more like just sort of happened, and the opportunities came up. I'll tell you how it happened with myself. Uh, basically, I, we had a, some general dental offices saying, have you ever thought about doing oral surgery? No, I'm an anodontist. But it's really, if you think about it, it's really the same business model. You can grow your practice quickly if you see emergencies, do the right thing, uh, treat the patients well, you can grow the practice. Now, you, you didn't mention the combo, for example, a perio and oral surgery. That would never work. You know why that wouldn't work, right? Because they both want to place the implants. Absolutely. But endo and oral surgery is, is great. Uh, and then even there's some cases, for example, a patient's referred in, tooth has to be extracted. It's not salvageable. But we'll call up the general dentist and say, hey, the patient's already here. You want to have the tooth extracted. So it works in cases like that. I actually like that because, you know, incentives matter. I mean, if they didn't matter, I mean, um, look at the, I mean, look at 1989 or 1990 when the Berlin Wall fell. I mean, you look at the population of Russia and the population of the United States and the GDP. Free enterprise did significantly better than a centrally planned economy. That, that that's that's amazing. But I always felt trouble with an endodontist because um, if they didn't extract the tooth and place implants, well, his only incentive is to just retreat the tooth. And then almost all of them, going back to 1987 when I opened, a lot of times they would retreat a root canal tooth, and six months later I'd pull it. And then the patient's like, I gave that guy 1500 bucks, and I had to throw it away. So I'd call back to the end and I'd say, do you have a refund? And they'd always say, no, 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 you know, I did my best, what could I do? And it's like when, the, when I started seeing some endodontist do the extraction and place the implant, or in your case where the endodontist works with oral surgeon, I thought, okay, they can make the money with the root canal or the implant. And I just think in the incentives of life, I feel safer that they're going to treat it more like their own tooth. Do you agree with that or not? I totally agree with that. You I'm, totally agree with I that. I totally agree. But, well, but, that, but That's but, a revolutionary statement. No, no. But what about the, you, you mentioned about you would get upset with the, the endodontist who did the retreatment and then sent them back to you had to be extracted. I'm surprised you didn't mention the case about the endodontist who did the retreatment, then the apico, and then you had to extract the tooth. Then you, <laughs> must, you must have really loved that. Uh, no, I, I think, no, but here's the thing about, uh, you know, this is maybe the, my revolutionary statement. I know there are some endodontists uh, that place implants, uh, and that's one thing. By the way, if that happens, they have to talk to the general dentist before. You can't just go ahead and do that, because maybe the general dentist works with another periodontist or oral surgeon who uh, places implants. Um, so, so I'll say that. Uh, the other thing about it is, again, it's all communication. It's all communication. You can't do anything like placing an implant or even extracting tooth without talking to a general dentist ahead of time. So, so we both see in the Valley here that, I mean, when you focus on the customer, you have patient focus that a dentist focused, it's the success like, if I take my kid to a pediatric dentist and they want to have concerns about the bite, I'd, I'd rather the orthodontist just be there. I don't I don't want to get a referral card and drive down the street and fill out another chart and all that stuff. And you're talking about oral surgery with endo. Do you see any other matches? <sighs> I mean, there there's 10 specialties now. Anesthesiology. Um, what, if, what if someone comes to your place and, and half the country says they're afraid of the dentist? Half the country says they're afraid of the pr- cost of the dentist. So you you got how many locations do you have? There's no one left then. Then you're that's about to 100. <laughs> percent um, how, how many locations do you have? So we have two locations in Tucson and eight in Metropolitan Phoenix. Uh, regarding how many anesthesiologists, uh, that, 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 I mean that you're that that's in the, I mean one out of a hundred dentists doesn't have. I mean that, the, 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 seriously, congratulations on that type of success. That that is. Top one one hundredth of one percent to have ten uh, locations. Yeah, a lot more aggravation though. No, sure. I, I'm just kidding. It, it's, it, just, it, 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 it's, it's a whole different set of problems. But you got your MBA and have ten locations. I'm just saying that one out of a thousand dentists will never reach that. It might be one. What would you say? One out of five thousand? No, something like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's very rare. I mean, I, I think it's becoming less rare. 
but yeah, it's. Um, and, and if you thought of 10 locations, well, he's from Canada. So in Canada, how many locations would that be? That'd be... That would be like 100 locations. That'd be 100 Canada. locations. <laughs> I mean, there's only so many igloos you can put your practices in. Um, so, so do you... So, so um, I'm, a, I'm afraid of a molar root canal. I mean, we've seen it for three decades. Or why do you get that? Why is it rotted off? To the, they're just afraid. In fact, I'm, I'm going through that right now. I'm, I'm having a... Preventing treatment for fear. I've, I've had this plantar fasciitis in my foot, and it's really bothering me. And the uh, pediatric di- or the podiatrist wants to give a shot of cortisone in my foot. And just the thought, I mean, my foot's sore, and the thought of jamming a needle in there, with, I, I, I won't even do it. So do you have anesthesiologists? Uh, actually, we do. Uh, you know, for the, obviously the oral surgeons, they'll do IV sedation when needed. But we've had cases where it's, I think, a little bit more complicated or let's say it's maybe a few endos on, uh, you know, a twelve-year-old or so. We'll bring an anesthesiologist in. Like let let thirty experts bring them in if we think it's something that's more than usual. So so what do you, so what do you say to um, people when they say there's no hospitals in Arizona where I can do the sedation and do the the cardiovascular bypass. I mean, in, in all the hospitals in America, don't they, and we're right here in Arizona, don't, isn't the anesthesia have to be an anesthesiologist and a surgeon? You can't do both in a hospital. So why, so they, I, I think I only continue to see that in, in dentistry, like at oral surgeon's office. Yeah. Is, is that something that's going away? And then the ADA, you got to comment on that. They just passed the 10th specialty just a few weeks ago. So now now they just added dental anesthesiology as a specialty. So do you, do you think the endodontist and the oral surgeons coming out of school will stop doing sedation and it'll be a, a dental anesthesiologist? I think in the that future? the endodontists that don't feel 100% comfortable doing sedations, they will bring someone in. And I think it's a good thing. If they, you know, I think it's enough sometimes to concentrate on doing the root canal and not have to worry about, you know, the patient's vitals or so. And if they can concentrate and do a better job doing the root canal by bringing someone in, all the power to them. So do you think you'll ever combine anesthesiologists just for a general dentist that wants to bring a patient in to do fillings and or pedo or is that... I was talking about combinations. We talked about pediatric dentistry plus ortho is a, is a much better business model than two separate places. Um, you're, you've combined endo and oral surgery, wildly successful to 10 locations. Do you, do you think there's any other marriages among the specialties? I, I think, um, I had to write down what you were saying. No, but I actually believe, I think bringing an anesthesiologist is something we've actually started entertaining. And you're referring dentists might really love it. Because, Absolutely. Because they could come in and, and do that. And by um, the way, as you know, you know, most patients that are really afraid of dentists, I mean, the ones that haven't been to a dentist in 20, 30 years. If you ask them, as you know, there was some event that happened when they were like seven years old or eight years old, and that's the same story. I went to my old dentist, and I, it was killing me, and I told them it hurts, and they just kept on going. They said, don't worry about it. Just hold on. Uh, so they actually have reasons why they haven't gone. And if it takes being put on there to do their procedures, I think it makes sense. Yeah, it's funny. I um, I could never understand. I, I had childhood, early childhood trauma with anxiety with that, where I was always afraid of dogs. And here I was, a wrestler, all through high school, and it could be like a little bitty, little bitty poodle, and it'd come around, and my heart would start racing. And I think to myself, why is that ten pound dog scaring me? It, it didn't. It didn't matter. And then I got married, and my ex said, "What? what where'd you get that scar on your butt?" And I said, well, I, I've never seen my butt. I'm not aware of a scar. And she was, like, trying to show me with a mirror. And so then um, one time we were at my mom's house, and my ex asked my mom, she goes, where's Howie? He's got a big scar on his butt. What is that? And she goes, oh, when he was so little and we lived on Rutan, he was running across the yard, and the big dog, neighbor dog, pounced on his back and took a big old chunk out of his butt. And I thought, that's why I'm... But the minute I understood that, you know, you start rationalizing mm-hmm. it that there's good dogs, but you know, it actually helped. And now you're not going to believe this, but um, last week I actually got a puppy. Oh, I nice. got a baby dog, and it doesn't scare me. But it, but I. So if they're scared, and it went, might not even have been a dentist, it might have been some physician sticking a 
popsicle stick halfway down his throat saying aw and gagging a little two-year-old and now he's just afraid of anybody in his mouth because he was so little he doesn't doesn't understand where that fear comes from well and, and as you know you know most people will fear for example they'll, they'll they'll fear a needle from a dentist a lot more than going for having your blood drawn or a tattoo exactly i've been uh oh yeah. my god um yeah, but basically, it's just the fear of not having the control. It's in your mouth. You don't see what's going on. If it's on your limb, or it depends on where your tattoo is, if you put it on your butt, like, to go along with your scar, that... You know why I don't that. have any tattoos? Why don't you? Yeah. Why not? You'll never see a bumper sticker on a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> I have four sons. Do you have tattoos? So that's my Raz to Buster and to half my boys. Um, but, but back to, it's, you know, it's 2020. Um... Are you still doing all your marketing towards dentists? You're still, there's not really a B2C play. I mean, there's not a, we see the lawyers with all the billboards called Goldberg and Osborne. Um, but you, is it just a better return on investment going to de general dentists as opposed to just going to the consumer? Well, you know, I've actually thought about, but what would a, an endodontist put on a billboard? Come to Steve Heimovich, he can really get on your nerves. <laughs> I mean, um, he's deeply. Deeply unnerving. <laughs> that was a good post the other day. I saw you on LinkedIn. That was fantastic. Uh, no, but he, but here's the thing. I've thought about when it comes to oral surgery, you know, there's a, a large group out there that does B2C. Uh, basically, most of our cases are, you know, $80,000 cases. I don't know if we can mention who they sure, are. Sure, absolutely. Um, Clear um, Choice. Clear Choice, the implant centers. Right. Clear Choice. And I don't. We, we had the founder oral surgeon on the show. Oh, cool! I mean, the only thing that's I, I just have to be aware of, and, and who knows, we might implement that in the future. But then again, because right now, uh, ninety nine percent of our patients come in from referring dental offices. What percent? I say ninety nine percent are all referred in, and the other one percent are people that I've had a root canal two years ago, and they know they need another one, and they like what happened the first time. Uh, so we, we have to be aware of, will that hurt our, the, our business model the way it is? So I don't know. Um, so what's, what's successful? Uh, so how many, so for 10 locations, how many marketing representatives do you have for 10 locations? So we have uh, two reps in Phoenix and one for Tucson. And what do they do? So basically, I'll tell you what they used to do. Uh, what they used to do was just drop off like you mentioned cookies drop off the cookies because they know drop dentists off. like me are committed to diabetes absolutely i'm i'm it's my goal um so you so it used to be cookies but now you know now it's a matter of what's in it for them uh and, and then we started offering ce courses for the doctors uh and but everyone does that now too and you have to sort of stay ahead of the curve uh, that's what we talked about earlier on uh you just have to Whatever's going on, you just have to be like a step ahead. And the one thing that I really noticed, or that a lot of offices notice, uh, a rep will go in, and most practices have reps now, and they'll go in and say, by the way, we're having a CE course for the doctors, and they'll tell the office manager, the front desk staff, here, because here's the flyer, they can learn about implants or, or whatever it is. But no one ever, like, what about, is the office manager like a chopped liver or so? So we just started, we're having now uh, like lectures on leadership for the front desk staff. And I don't think no one else does that. Now maybe, hopefully if you're in Arizona, like don't listen to what I just said, but uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but that's, I think that we just have to be a step ahead. So now it's not, a, what, are you, what are you doing for the doctor? What are you doing for the staff now? You have to d give them something that no one else is doing. Yeah, they, they, these kids just don't get it. That The reason I'm uh, not afraid of DSOs is because the patients just always come back and they say, well, every time I go there, it's a different dentist, it's a different hygienist. And then when I go into the dental offices that are crushing it, they've learned how to retain staff 7, mm -hmm. 10, 12, 15 years. And if you can't keep your staff, it's the same skill to keep your wife, your staff, your kids... I mean, like, like, um, you know, when, when, you, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's just all human. It's like, just why, why do your kids not want to see you? Why do your ex leave you? Why did your staff quit after two or three years? What, you know, it's that turnover thing. And if you figure out relationships, it, 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 it's, it's a reward in every aspect of your life. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I know we've seen articles about giving staff bonuses, which we do, but that's only part of it. I mean, the staff, you know, we know patients think this and staff does too. What's the expression? You know, people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you have to be, you mentioned, I think, the word uh, being authentic earlier on. Uh, they have to know you, that you have their back. It just can't be that the staff, they, they don't want to feel that they're just there to make you more money. If you're doing something for them, letting them grow, letting them go on CE courses and, you know, giving them, at the end of the day, it's not just a raise, it's also saying, hey, Mary, thanks for staying late tonight. I really appreciate you staying for the emergency. You have to do stuff like that. You have to be authentic with them. And I, I, I want to talk about some of the myths I've noticed about leadership. Like a lot of them, um, a lot of people think like the customers first. No, your 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 staff is your tribe. And when a person comes in and starts dropping the f bomb and screaming at my receptionist, I pick up the phone and call nine one about once a decade. And my staff comes first. You're not going to abuse my staff because you're the customer and going to give us money. I'm I'll so fire you. And the first one I had to fire was my favorite drinking buddy. And I, I don't want to say John's last name or it'll get back to him, but <laughs> I loved him, but my staff couldn't stand him and the way he the, the way he is. I saw past it. I, he's this guy, but I just see the little teddy bear in him. But anyway, um, there, there seems to be a lot of myths in, in leadership. Um, the, they, the staff wants you um, to protect them and, and lead them and, and be their side. What, what, what do you think are some of the current myths in leadership versus what you have done to roll out 10 offices? I think, first of all, everyone has their own style of leadership. Uh, and a lot of people might think, you know what, I do not talk like MLK or JFK or any other alphabet soup uh, leaders. Uh, not everyone could be Gandhi, but everyone has their own style. My style is, I think it's what people see. I'm authentic. I remember when I first started my first office, you know, we had a water cooler, uh, we had our five gallon, you know, bottle we had to be changed every day. And I, I, I did that, not because I wanted to prove something, that's just who I was. And I think they know, uh, if they ask me a question, I'll tell them the honest answer. They know that I'm, def I'm not perfect, I'm definitely not perfect, that's for sure. They figured that one out pretty soon, but they know I'll listen to them. I really care what they think. Um, the staff. The staff? I, I, you know, I, um, last week I lectured at the Florida Dental Association. Um, this, uh, a couple of days ago was a towny meeting, but I, I'm surprised. You know, I've lectured a thousand times how many staff come up to me and they say, well, will you talk about this? And I'm like, okay, but why? Well, our doctor does this. Well, did you ask your doctor about that? Oh my God, no way. He'd fire us. And then I've been in dental offices with really nice guys that I like. And the staff will come back and ask a question about a radiograph, and they'll say, well, if you want to know that, go to dental school. That's above your pay grade. And I'm like, what? How? I mean, if, if your own assistant doesn't understand what you're doing, how did, that would have to affect the treatment plan acceptance rate. If you can't explain it to your assistant, how the hell are you explaining it to your patient? What, 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 why, why, why do you think some guys like us are more open book with our staff? And others have this, you know, this snoot, this higher level. I, I think, you know, I don't know who uses this expression, but I really believe it. If you think you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not even in that room. But people that are in the trenches, they know a lot more than you think they know. Uh, you know, it's really funny. Uh, when some people bring in consultants, that there's the problems with culture in an office. They're bringing a consultant. Some consultants are good, but what they're doing is they're just talking to the staff that you've never talked to. Right. They usually know. If there's a problem in the office, talk to your office manager, unless the problem is the office manager. You know, you know what almost every dental consultant has told me their whole get, their whole stick is? They go to the office and they want a 30-minute closed-door interview with every staff member and doctor's spouse if they're involved in the office. And after they just do that for, you know, half a day, they totally understand that everything's going. And that doctor has never done that and is not even aware of half the issues. And they're just like, how in the, how in the, I mean, so in marriage it's communication, 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 same with staff. Why, why, why do you think they'll go tell a consultant everything they think's right or wrong with his practice, but, they, but doc doesn't know? 
I think it was a doctor that didn't really care to think about knowing. It's all basic stuff. They all know that kind of stuff. Just ask the people. Just knowing, and again, knowing that other people have opinions. That I know we go, we went through dental school. We did well. We if we got to specialty school, we did. We think we really we're really smart. You know. By the way, you do know this while we're talking about being really smart. Uh, the difference between God and an oral surgeon, right? <laughs> the oral surgeon that God knows he's not an oral surgeon, right? That's right. <laughs> so, but that doesn't mean that you can't get information or what's going on by the staff. And I think that's just where it comes from. You know, I just n knew you want to surround yourself with smart people. And if I think I'm the smartest person, then I'm really not smart. So all the answers are there. You know, what do they say? Something I think people have to bring a consultant in because it, it's better than not talking to the staff. At least they'll talk to the staff. But you know, there's a, what someone's, there's a book out there that said, uh, does a consultant, what does he do? Does he borrow your watch and tell you what time it is? Now that's partially true, but if, if you're not gonna get the information, at least they'll find out for you. But just knowing your staff, like they care, they want, they want, they want to help you. And a lot of specialists don't even, real, they don't even, it's, it's like, you know, you know, you always hear this joke about it. I'm not a racist. You know, they say, I, I have a friend who's, you know, whatever, Hispanic or whatever. And, and, and then, then they'll say something. It's like, no, no, that, that, that's racist. And specialists, it's so funny. They don't even know they're elitist because you'll hear them in a group. Oh, so are you a dentist? No, I'm an orthodontist. Oh, I'm sorry. You, did, you mean you didn't go to dental school? You don't have a DDS degree? You have a DDS degree. You're a dentist. And and I only I only one time was with an oral surgeon, and the waitress said, uh, uh, "So are you all dentists? There are four of us." And the oral surgeon said, "Yeah, we're all dentists." And I just thought, "Damn, dude, that's I've been a dentist twenty years. You're the first oral surgeon that told a waitress you were a dentist." Well, I mean, what I have found though is I found like by being an endodontist, that an eight dollars will get me a venti macchiato at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> So can you expand on what you talked about in your book, Dr. Steve's Four Steps to Leadership Nirvana? You know, usually I find, like, the first step is, like, being the boss. You're someone's boss. And normally you get that, um, but you're promoted. You're not the office manager. You're someone's boss. That's usually the first level. And by the way, I by doing a lot of research and running the book, I realized even being a parent doesn't make you the boss. We all you have you have four boys, and I, and I have three girls and two boys, and they've all told me by the time they're two years old, hey dad, you're not my boss. So even being a parent is not not your boss. No, the second level is what I call like being friendly to them, and what I mean by that, I don't mean that as a weakness, but they respect you. They respect you. Uh, you know, you can you can't just tell them what to do if they feel that you're not authentic, if they feel you do something different than what you say, you're not gonna lead them anywhere. The third step, or whatever, the third level I think of uh, leadership, basically you have to be the delivery man or delivery woman. You have to produce. So you can be, uh, be their boss, be in charge of someone, have a group underneath you. You can be friendly, they can respect you, but if you haven't done anything, if you haven't produced anything, they're not gonna follow you, they're not gonna lead you. So for example, I'm sure if someone works for you for being in any, any of your social media stuff or at your office, you've been there, done that. So they're gonna follow you. Now it's not just because you're nice, not just because you're a good leader, it's because you've actually produced something. Uh, that's the third thing. And, and the fourth thing I find like a good leader is a mentor. It's not just, okay, I'm a good leader, I've learned, I've read a lot of books, but what am I doing for them? Am I training them, training them how to lead? Do I, do I want to grow their leadership? And that to me is the fourth step, the highest level of being a leader. Um, I shouldn't ask you this question because you're a boy, but um, you know when we were in school, it was a mostly all male profession, and all the workers were pretty much female. Even in the hospitals, I mean, there's a million MDs, there's uh, two hundred eleven thousand dentists, but when you go in the hospitals, it's high ninety percentile that it's women. 
And some of the women are saying that, um, that you know, we still have a mostly female workplace, mm-hmm. but that they respond to women leaders differently than they respond to male leaders. Do you think that's true? I mean, neither of us are experts. I can tell you, don't even listen to his answer because he's a man. <laughs> but do you, when, when these young women, these 25-year-old dentists, they were your associate, they watched you lead, you sold her the practice, you walk out the door, and she says they treat them differently because they're girls. Do you believe that, not believe that? you think there's some truth to that? I'm not saying this is right or wrong, and I think you probably will agree with me on this. If, if you took a room of 100 dental assistants, and it just is that probably the large majority are female. What percent? Like what percent of all your dental assistants are female? I'd In say 10 locations. 90%. Yeah, yeah same here. And uh, the fact of the matter is, I know this may not sound right, but it's, I think you'll agree with me. And if you ask them, raise your hand if you'd rather work for a male dentist, and then raise your hand for a female dentist. And I think the large majority, if not all of them, would rather work for a male dentist. I just think that's the, I think that's. And you think that's because we're homo sapiens? Or a male dominant society, whereas the other great ape Bonobos is a female dominant society. Just like the great whales, the female is half the size and she's the alpha and she swims down the middle. And those, those big bull whales do what she says. And I'm surprised at, at the lack of research. Even when I was in MBA school at ASU, mm-hmm. when they were talking about management, I said, well, you know, when they would quote studies, I said, well, where, where's the Bonobo studies? They're, they're females are the alpha. And they just say, I don't think there is any. And I'm like, well, there should be a lot of that. But do you think it's because they're born a homo sapien and homo sapien is a male-dominated society as opposed to a bonobos female? Do you think that's why they're raising their hand? Or do you think it's more culture, tradition, or something? I think it's more culture and tradition. And again, Mm -hmm. I may be saying the wrong things here, but I think a lot of, look, male dentists, or all dentists, we want to be the, the good guy, we don't want to be the bad guy. But I think growing up, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, we used to hear the word, you don't want to be a male chauvinist pig. We've heard that one before. No one's heard about that recently. And I think we, we want to make sure that we never ask a staff member for, can you bring me a cup of coffee? Like, we're just trained. We just don't do that anymore. We don't want to give any appearance that we're taking advantage of the fact that someone's a female. Not that they need us to protect them, but I think that's the way we are. We want to make sure, you know, we tell Mary at the end of the day, great job. We, we just, we want to be like that. We want to be like that. I mean, hopefully we should be like that with our wives too. I have to work on that one. But uh, I think that's part of it. And I think, now what I've heard, uh, talking to some female assistants, like why do you not, why would you prefer to work with a male dentist? They're saying, not a large sample size, but the ones I've asked that question to, I think because some female dentists, they don't have to think that. They don't have to. So if they're a little stern with asking an assistant, a, a female assistant for an instrument, I think they're less apt to hesitate about not saying something in the wrong way or hurting their feelings. So I know this sounds, this may be a little controversial, but I think if you talk to most assistants, I think they'll agree with me. Well, you know, I, um, I, uh, well, I, I always thought there was a huge biological component. I mean, if, you know, if all the sapiens, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, gibbons are male-dominated and bonobos are female. There's got to be a genetic component. But a lot of it is cultural, too. I saw it with my, in my own family. I, I'm so sensitive to women because I grew up with five sisters. And I could sw- we, we lived about 100 yards from the Arkansas River. I could swim in it and fish in it any time of the day. My sisters could not swim in the, in the river. And I'd ask my mom, well, why, why can't they swim with me? I don't want him to drown. And then I'm like, well, you let me swim. Does that mean you want me to drown? Or And, and I'd always think to myself, why is what is my male anatomy going to do in a current, in a river that my, you know what I mean? I mean, is it a, a, some life-saving device? Um, so so they're, they're coming out of school. They're, the, the ADEA, the American Dental Education Association, says they're averaging $283,000 in debt. Um, what is your top financial advice for young dentist entrepreneurs? I mean, I think get some financial mentors. Oh, by the way, I would, I've changed my answer a little bit. I think maybe you said it right on last Thursday at your convention, which I think was the, like, I think might be in reality the best advice, right? 
And, and, you, and you said, uh, and I quote, I'm sure you'll tell me if you, if you got this wrong, the best financial advice to tell a young dentist would be, A, don't get married. And if you do get married, don't have any kids. But that being said, but I, but that's sort of true. But 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 I'm married and I have five kids. I went in. But but I I was saying that to put it in perspective because you know they 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 just whine about their two hundred eighty three thousand dollars in debt and it's like that's the cost of a kid. Mm -hmm. So you had five kids. I had four kids. Let's say you went to dental school and you're going to have five like Doctor H or four like me. We'll have one less kid and and now your whole student loan thing is gone. And you've, you're old enough to have a lot of friends, I'm sure, that have got divorced. How many of them did their divorce cost more than their student loans? Um, a lot more. <laughs> I mean, God, a lot more. I mean, so so your, your student loan, it seems so big to you because you're, you're in dental kindergarten school and you're a baby. So when you're a 25-year-old baby and you see this 283, you think that's a lot of money. But there will be a year where you will make that and more in one year. Absolutely. So every one of you kids that are, I don't care what you graduate in student loan debt, there will be a year where you will show that amount to the IRS in one year. So back to um, financial advice for young dentist entrepreneurs, you're saying get a mentor. Get a mentor. Uh, don't, and don't pick a mentor that is less successful than you. Pick someone who you trust. Uh, you know, make sure you have a good accountant. Uh, make sure you get a, have a good financial advisor. Uh, the other thing I will say this: if you want to start off quick before you make any appointments with any professionals, read uh, read the millionaire millionaire next door. That's that's one you got to read. Uh, the one written by the two PhDs. Exactly. I think one Stanley is the the, the name, and basically you got to read that because it talks so much about a lot of dentists, a lot of dentists that make if they do very well in terms of income, but they may not make the amount of income of a plastic surgeon. Uh, just learn about how to live in, how to live within your needs. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to drive a used Yugo, but you can. Uh, there's ways of controlling things, um, and sort of save early if you can. I love that book, The Millionaire Next Door: The Surprising Secrets of America's Wealthy. Came out in 1996 by Thomas J. Stanley and William Danko, but it was a compilation of two PhD researchers. And so much of it was mind-blowing. And I think the most mind-blowing thing to me, which I've always said, is which occupation made the most millionaires? You would think it'd be, oh, it's got to be physicians, surgeons, dentists, and and on. It was teachers. And why? Because since they made so much less money, their ego says, well, I'm not going to buy a big house and a big car and take vacations in Hawaii. I'm just a little teacher. So on vacation, we're going to go camping. So they saved. And they, they saved consistently on a smaller amount of money. So by the time they were 65, they had more money than dentists, physicians, and surgeons. And everyone says, it's not what you make, it's what you save. And what, what stresses me out with dentists is when I'm with their, uh, with a, as a couple, you know what I mean? And I know the dentist and he's all stressed out and he wants to increase his production. He's asking me what he should do. And it's like, dude, you already collect a million and take home 300. Why are you so stressed? Well, because they live in a 5,000 square foot home. They don't go camping at the lake. They fly to Hawaii. And then I'll ask them, I'll say, name me one as one aspect of your life where you live below the median. And, and, and then I'll say, is it restaurants? Because I've heard your wife say, this is the thing that annoys me so much. And I say, well, I don't do chain restaurants. It's like, well, what, what are you, royalty? <laughs> I mean, I thought you were just some bumblebee from Iowa. And you met him at Iowa, and and now you're above chain. Re I mean, I don't even I don't even like restaurants if the food doesn't have a picture. Because if they don't have a picture of the food, like they did all the quality restaurants, like the IHOP um, and the Waffle House. I mean, you know, it's just going to be a hundred dollar meal for two for no apparent reason. But mm -hmm. and their their wedding rings too big. You'll never see uh, you'll never see the female. Um, in a dental marriage um, with a little quarter carat diamond. It's always some big three carat thing. Their cars are Benzes and Range Rovers. I'm like, where where do you live below average? And that's why the teacher will be a millionaire and not how much money <coughs> they produced and collected. It was how much they consistently saved living below your lifestyle. If they do, do go spend two weeks in Hawaii and you ask them, why are you spending two weeks in Hawaii? Well, I'm, I'm so stressed out 50 weeks of the year. I'm, I'm worried about money. That's why I have to spend two weeks in Hawaii to sort of compensate for that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Just just 
quit spending so much money. And my car, um, you know, to, to uh, own up to it, my car's a 2004. And I'm going to go to the Lexus dealer um, tomorrow because the uh, front light bulb burned out. Every time I go in there, they're like, well, if you just give us your car and $98,000, you can have a 2019. Like, I go from my home to my work. I mean, why, why, and of all the places that you would drop a hundred grand, how much, why, why would your first idea to be to upgrade your car? Well, it's really fun. A hundred grand to upgrade your car? That works perfectly fine. But here's the funny thing about that. Now, if you ask them to, let's say, take a few extra CE courses or go to a convention, no, no, that's outside of my budget. And what, what was it, Ben Franklin who said something like the, the best the best investment is on your education or on yourself that could bring you the best returns. But that's the funny thing about it. No problem spending money on a car, but not on yourself. Yeah. So I, I, asked, you, I, I asked you the question wrong. At first I said, what financial advice would you give young dentist entrepreneurs? Now I'm just going to take the same question about the finance. What, what, just what general advice would you give the young dentist entrepreneur? If you're running your own office, um, and you talked about this last week, I think it was uh, the management guru, Peter Drucker, Drucker, said, you can't manage what you don't measure. Uh, and, you know, you can talk to certain dentists and I'll, for example, complain. Not that any dentists complain. Uh, of course they complain. But they'll say, well, my cash flow is terrible. Um, yeah, I think my accounts receivable are terrible. And you ask them, so what percentage of your accounts receivable are over 90 and, and, and the look on their faces, if you ask them, how many neurons are in your index finger? Because you know they're not measuring it. So, of course, they can't manage it. So just knowing, you have to look at the numbers. Don't just go by gut feeling. Uh, I think you mentioned... Come on, we got guts. You know, I got a lot of guts. Well, I, I, I want to be pro-guts. <laughs> well, I, well I feel, <laughs> actually, I feel bad about that to you mentioned last week. I'm just storing, in case there's ever a, a big catastrophe out there, I have, I have a lot of, you know, pistachios and when other nuts. I'm storing them for the winter. Fat is just future meals already eaten, and I am ready for the asteroid to hit. I'm climbing <laughs> a cave and hibernating for six months. Um, I want these kids not to learn everything the hard way. What are some of the mistakes you made that you think they should uh, learn from you telling them about it as opposed to doing it themselves? Um. Number one, getting a mentor, if you can, join a mastermind group, uh, being with other people that have seen around the corners. Uh, in terms of some specific things I've learned personally, I have to follow the, the new adage in my mind, hire slow and fire fast. Um, too many times in the past, uh, you know, I may have, may have had that employee I go home and vent like every night for like two years or so. And uh, instead of like, no, you have to coach them. You have to counsel them. And I mean really coaching and counseling, not like the first step before you fire someone. But at a certain point, someone may not make it. And you have to, you can't let that go on for two years. Um, yeah, it, it's my, my biggest mistake too. I mean, my, my mistake's hanging out there. Everybody can see it. I mean... My company's 31 years old, and the five or six management people that run the entire thing have been there 20 years. So it took 10 years to build a management team. And it was, it was trial and error. It was, it was thinking that it was more important to go get my um, fellowship in the Mission Institute and my diplomat in the International Congress of Royal Pontologies and my FA genius. I was so busy as the cook in the kitchen learning every recipe I could and I, and I wasn't focusing on my management team that, and, and going back, oh my God, it would have been so much easier to spend seven three-day weekends with Carl Misch if I would have had the team I have now. But like my office manager's 20 years, Lori the president is 20 years, Ken the programmer's 20, they're, they're all 20 years. So don't spend 11 years working on your craft. I would, I would get out of school and start working on your team. Hire slow, fire fast. As soon as you get a bunch of people committed to your vision, your team, your business, every year that they stay on the team means I'm responsible for less and less. I mean, why would you hire really smart people 
and then I get out of their way. I mean, I don't want to, you know, I, 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 just, I could go on and on and on forever about that. And another problem I see with Dennis is natural selection. I always give the example of bipolar where um, the United States had a 4% rate and Europe had a half percent rate. And for 20 years, they just thought, okay, well, obviously that couldn't be, and they're measuring it differently. And it took them literally 30 years before the head of John Hopkins Psychiatric Hospital wrote a book, How a Little Bit of Crazy Leads to a Lot of Success. Who are the most likely people in Europe to say, you know what, screw this country. I'm, I'm going to get in a boat where one in eight sink in the Atlantic and land here with this shirt on my back. It was a bipolar trap. I mean, all these crazy manic people came here. Well, the dentist is a natural selection. I mean... You need to have a strong emotional quotient, but they, they were they were selected because of their math and geometry and physics and chemistry skills, which is usually some geek in the library. So how do you how like your Scottsdale Institute on Leadership? You're getting a lot of dentists. Dentists are science. They're scientists. Do you think the typical dentist has a bigger gap from understanding the emotional quotient feelings they got the iq or they wouldn't be a dentist you can't say oh i'm a dentist and i have a low iq and i'm not smart no you're a doctor but do you think their iq is almost against an eq well yeah they obviously have a high iq but it's not really their fault that their emotional quotient isn't that high i mean in in, in high school we learn how many of you have learned Algebra in high school, all of you. How many have learned about self-awareness? None of you. How many have learned, uh, you know, history? All of you. How many of you have learned how to deal with other people knowing how their emotional intelligence is? Like, none of you. So, so no one has learned any of this stuff. Uh, so it's just a matter of being aware. These are the things that we were never taught. So, and, and, that, and by the way, that seems to be like the secret sauce for, with a lot of CEOs. They all have high IQs. So it's not as if that's not important. But the difference between, and studies have shown this, the ones that have higher EQs, their companies do better. That's just a fact. So we just don't know how to deal with certain issues. And the first thing is to deal with yourself. You know, it used to be called, you know, in the old days, it was anger management. Yeah, <laughs> great show. But you cannot, <laughs> if you wanted to put on a course saying, Come and give a we'll give an electron anger management. No one's interested in that. But if you have emotional intelligence, that's people are interested in that. But I really think that's like one of the key ingredients. Like these days, you have to know that how to deal with people. And that's what you're doing at the Scottsdale Leadership and Coaching Center. When when did that when did that all start? We actually, my wife Julie and myself, we founded that two years ago. Uh, just knowing, you know, I, I feel like endodontics and oral surgery technically. You know, we, we, I, I know that, we know that. Uh, however, I really, really started to start believing, and you know, I did my, my executive coaching certificate, that secret sauce, the thing that's missing in a lot of offices is the leadership, is emotional intelligence. And that's why I figured I can't just have it in my mind. I want to teach it. I want other people to know about it. I really do feel that that's really that secret sauce that people have to know about. When, when you're talking about emotional intelligence, you also talk a lot about marrying the head and the heart. Is that emotional? I, you know, you know, I, I started thinking about that concept, I, about marrying your head and your heart. And, and one of the examples, you know, we talked about uh, you want to hire slow and fire fast. And look, dentists in general, we want to be the good guys. I mean, that's what we're dealing with patients all day. You, you're calming on patients. Don't worry about it. But we've, we've done this a few times before. Don't worry about it. Uh, but you have, for example, like that employee in your head, you just know she's just not cutting it. I mean, she's just not. You've canceled her or him. Uh, you've coached the, the, that person. And, and you just realize, look, I'm not saying in your office or my office, but I've heard rumors of sometimes an employee is not the sharpest tool in the shed. That, that happens sometimes, right? <laughs> but our heart may be saying, but you know what? Every year, you know, he or she gives me a birthday card. And they bring me in a gift card for Starbucks. That's what my heart is telling me. And we, we want to be the, so we do what, what happens. We're on 10 years. We may have the same employee going home and uh, bitching about it at home to our spouse and just, 
But, but there's a way of you, you can marry that. And, and uh, this consultant actually once, I heard him uh, speak and said, well, there's a way to fix that. You can fire the person, but you can still send them a birthday card every year. You can still meet them once every six months at Starbucks. So it's just a marrying, knowing what's in your head, but you want to, and you, you have to sort of work around. You can't just totally want to love an employee. You have to make a tough business decision sometimes. I loved um, Abraham Maslow's book on management because it was a, I already massively respected him as an anthropologist. <laughs> Um, um, him and Desmond Morris were my two favorite anthropologists. And he wrote a book on Maslow on uh, management. And I, I see, we were asked, talking about girls earlier, um, Abraham Maslow, if I'm your boss, I can't be your friend because I reserve the right to fire you. Mm -hmm. You're not going to fire your mom. You're not going to fire your sister. And you're not going to fire your best buddy. So, so there has to be some professional lines drawn in the sand where I want, I don't want to be toxic. I want to be, I want to be there for my tribe, but I am the leader of the tribe. I'm, imagine if you were the coach of the ASU football team and your best buddies were the athletes and they came in and said, ah, oh, I don't want to work out today. We were out partying until 1 a.m. and you laugh and like, oh yeah, I get it. You know, I mean, that's not what you're, that's not what the players need. Their players need a coach. And you're their coach, you're not their friend. And, and, and a great coach will make that athlete rise to new levels. Absolutely. You know, many, many years ago, uh, I used to be in the, in the uh, Army Reserve up in Canada. And, but in all, in the Army anywhere, in our forces, you have, that's why you have a mess hall for officers, you have a mess hall for senior NCOs, because yes, you can be friendly, yes, you can be nice, you can be authentic, but you can't be buddy buddy with them, and you can't be buddy buddy with someone who you may have to fire in the future. Do you remember that movie? UB. It was a submarine movie. UB one forty six or. Do you remember John, that? John F. Kennedy? The, the the submarine movie, the World War Two submarine, where they were trying to steal. It was the a Enigma. German movie, right? Yeah, yes. where they were trying to steal the German Enigma, and um, Matthew McConaughey says, um, "Why didn't I get the promotion?" And basically, it came down to like, are you ready to send? I mean, you're real popular with the crew. Are you ready to send them on a mission where they might not come back? And 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 then and Matthew McConaughey thought about it. He says, "See, just just the fact that you hesitated, Absolutely. you're not ready. And are you ready to tell your assistant? No, you, you're five minutes late." And they say, well, my babysitter. Look, there's flight attendants who drop off their kid and go on a four day flight. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's four million people in the valley. You in the valley don't don't tell me you're the only one with a kid and a babysitter. I mean, you you have to be their their manager. Yeah, um, I, I want to ask you something. D, DSOs are getting big now. Do you consider your ten locations? Are you a DSO? Um, I I like to. I don't consider ourselves DSOs. A DSO. Now we might, from a I guess from an official point of view, call myself that. But I just feel, the reason I don't feel that, like deep down, uh, because I manage, I, I, I think I care, uh, well, this may be a little biased here, I, I think some DSOs just manage by p and I don't think they necess necessarily get the leadership and emotional intelligence stuff and growing their people. Uh, maybe some do, but not all, all of them do. And that's why I think, so my gut reaction to that is no. But I guess if, according to the what measures of DSO are, I guess maybe we are. Well, are are all those doctors that work for you, all those endodontal surgeons, are they all employees or are any of them partners? Uh, none of them are partners yet. None of them are partners. So, so they're all employees? They're all employees. Well, I mean, that it's amazing that you could get that many people to sign on and do it. I mean, it speaks volumes of you. If you're listening to this thing, and now that guy's an idiot. Well, the proof in the pudding is so overwhelming the opposite of that. How do you how do you attract and retain highly educated endodontists and oral surgeons who say, no, nah, I don't want to own my own place. I want, I want to work for you. Well, first of all, you, you asked me the question, uh, are they all employees or partners? And, and I really believe they're employees from a tactical IRS standpoint. But when I, when I mentioned about talking about staff and talking with the office managers, getting their input, they're not treated like employees, whatever that word is, treated like employees. I mean, the doctors, for example, they know 
I don't tell them how to schedule patients. I don't tell them what rotary files to use. So I treat them like partners, and I really do. Um, so how do I track them? I think when I interview anyone, uh, first of all, I think if they want someone who's down to earth and authentic, I think they'll definitely want to work with me. Uh, if they want someone to walk in and say, hi, I'm Steve Heimovich, I got my MBA, and uh, you have the opportunity to learn with me, like if they're looking for that, then I'll tell them like, don't just go to someone else. Um, so I, I think just knowing, and by the way, the, the other thing I do, I always tell people on, when I first talk to them on the phone, because there's no endo program or oral, well, no endo program in Arizona, there isn't an oral surgery program. I always say to you, to them, you know, I can give you any line of crap over the phone, but I, I want you to talk to the guys and gals that work with me, talk to them. And they'll tell you, and I think that's usually my biggest selling point. So I think that's why they work with me, and that's why I think they stay with me. Now, do they all have the same um, pay structure? I mean, endoscopy oral surgery, is it all, they all have the same pay structure? Well, first of all, any of my... I, if, this, I, if this gets too personal, tell me. No, no, I'm, not, no I'm, I'm just saying if I'm talking to my endodontist here, uh, I'm not going to give the answer on that one because then they may, you know, they may be mad at the oral surgeons and the oral surgeons may be mad right. at the, the endodontist. I'm sort of saying that have... They'll, they'll basically, no, they all have... Well, it's all based on supply and demand. I mean, if, it, if it's harder to hire an endodontist than a general dentist or an oral surgeon, it just it is what it is. I, I hate it when teachers say... Well, why does the Arizona Diamondbacks hitter, why does he get paid a million dollars a year and I get paid 30000 a year? Well, can you hit a ball out of the ballpark? That matters in baseball. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, so basically, I mean, they all get pretty old, very high salaries. I mean, you need to do that to attract any specialist these days. Salaries as opposed to production? Both. Both, yeah. I mean, a high base salary, but if they produce more, they'll make more. Right. Because if you if you just say, hey, here's, and some practices do this, especially in the East Coast, here's your salary, but if you're twice as much as someone else, you're not going to make any more, there has to be some incentive for someone to produce more. So I, I want to ask you, and um, you should be biased against the answer because you don't want to hurt your business, but I would advise, a, um, a, again, that, that, that the, the retail business, I mean, we both got an MBA from ASU, and the retail, there's so much research on the, on the retail, it goes back... 300 years from around the world that, you know, you had these little shop houses of two or 300 square foot and you lived above them. And the next generation put you out of business because they went to twice the space. They went to 500 square foot. The next generation went to 1,000 and 2,000 and 4,000. Mm -hmm. And now we maxed out, um, you know, we got these Ikeas and Walmarts that are 250,000 square foot. It's just convenience. And and what's cute is when I go back to developing words, like the first time, you won't even believe this when I tell you, the first time I, I, I always did a tour about every five years in Australia, starting in 1990, I fly down, I do Auckland, New Zealand, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, Adelaide, Gold Coast. And I do that like every five years. When I first went down there, you couldn't go into a grocery store and buy everything you needed for dinner. You had to go to the bread shop. You had to go to the butcher shop. You had to go to the wine shop. I mean, you had to go to six different shops. Mm -hmm. Whereas Americans would walk into a Kroger or Costco and get it all at once. Um, do you think the future business model um, is that instead of you have 10 locations that the endodontist actually comes to your office and does a molar root canal for that one-stop shot? Do you see yourself lining with million dollar practices says we'll come in every every friday and do your endo or something like that or, or do you think is that something you've thought of? i'm sure you've thought about it yeah i thought about it and what i first of all what i'll say is i, I think you asked the wrong question you said what do i think it's not about what i think you know i i remember growing up in montreal all the dentists were in professional buildings and when i first came down to arizona seeing a dentist in a strip mall like oh my god that's something that i can't believe people go to that but they do. That's so what I think. That doesn't necessarily mean what the reality is. So at the end of the day, it's not what I think. I know patients these days, look, people are still, the economy is going pretty well now. May change the next year or two, probably will. Uh, but they've been in times where you can't tell the boss, hey, I need another day off to go for another procedure because I have to drive to a different location. So at the end of the day, it's about convenience. Uh, that's why offices, if you want to, expand you've got to have extra hours you can't just have bankers hours you can't just close at three o'clock the way bankers even they've changed 
Uh, so I think that's convenience is where it's at. So what I think, of course, I'd rather have it that it's just the end of dawn if we have our own fiefdom and neural surgeons have their own office. But I think that's, you got to go where the customers are, right? And what they want. And I think it's just becoming more and more, and that's what's in it for the, for the patient. Yeah. You just, and, and what's funny, you know how we said that racist people usually don't know their races. They mm -hmm. say, oh, I got a friend that's, you know, that. And uh, and then they say something that's racist. Um, dentists always say they're they're patient focused, but they're not. They're dentist focused. Their hours are eight to five Monday through Thursday. The patient, the, the consumer, can call over their lunch hour, and that's when your phones are being forwarded. Um, I mean, I mean, you could name twenty things about the average dental office that are all doctor focused mm -hmm. and not patient focused. And they think they're all patient focused, well, and they're just not. Well, they think because they have a, maybe a picture. That's up on the wall that says our patient is number one. But they call up on, let's say, Friday at two o'clock, and they're, they have their faces blowing up. Sorry, the, the doctor's golfing. Why don't you call us up on Monday morning? So that's, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little and, bit. No, but you're not exaggerating. And, and we, I have data for Arizona because I live here, but I have data for the United States. But let's just focus on Arizona where you and I have practiced for decades. Eight and a half percent of emergency room visits in the state of Arizona are odontogenic in origin. Wow. In fact, I always thought if I was going to do a deal like you, oral surgery and endo, I would I would be putting my locations in the um, biggest hospital emergency rooms. So in triage, you can say, oh, is this tooth? Is this mouth related? Okay, you need to go down the hall and turn to the right. Mm -hmm. Eight and a half out of a hundred? I mean... Um, that, that, that's just crazy. It means we're not doing our job. Right. And the sad part about it, most of those patients will get a prescription for antibiotics and here's some pain meds. It's not really helping them. Yeah. Have you ever had a patient come in with a two foot by two foot radiograph of their, of their skull for a toothache? No, but I have. I had it one time. I've had patients coming in just uh, going to the ER on the weekend and they were referred to the ENT and realized it was like a lower molar. That was causing them their problems. So you said, and I'm going to hold you to it, that if um, if they email you, you'll give them a free copy of the book? Yes. If you email me at onlyendo at AOL.com, O-N-L-Y. Oh, no, I, you can't say AOL.com. I know. Only, only, her, only her grandpa uses an AOL account. Well, I think myself and eight other people still have AOL. <laughs> so uh, only Endo, E-N-D-O, although if I had to spell Endo, then maybe you're, the, you're, you're watching the wrong podcast here. Only Endo at AOL.com. Just put in the subject matter. I want my free book. Uh, send me your address. I'll be more than happy to send you out a copy. That is uh, so nice of you. And why are you doing that? Why, why, why are you giving a free copy of your book? Uh, you know, I like to, uh, you know, I, it makes me feel good knowing that, like you talked about earlier on the mistakes I've made or the lessons I've learned, never made mistakes, just a lot of lessons. Uh, I like sharing that. I, I like other people. There's, you can give a little and people will, will receive a lot by it. So, um, but, but finish, oh, we, I, we went way over an hour. We, we need to uh, stop. Um, <laughs> um. So, so talk more, are you and your wife, Julia, are you guys having fun at this, at this uh, Scottsdale Leadership and Coaching Center? Absolutely. And the reason I really, we both love it is because all of these concepts about leadership, emotional intelligence, they're all common sense stuff, but people don't hear about it. They don't know about it. And it's just a matter of when you, when you actually give a lecture, it's not like giving like... In biochemistry, they gave something the Krebs cycle and everyone looks like they're the deer in the headlights. They don't understand what you're saying. But all these concepts, you can learn about, people understand. They can say, okay, I get it. I, 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 can, I can do that. And it's stuff that you can apply in the office. It's stuff you can apply at home. Most intelligence. I mean, I mean, people can, you know, you can, some dentists yell at their staff, but they'll never, but, or they won't yell at the staff, they'll yell at their kids. And there's like, there's lots to learn, there's way to, ways to grow, and this is basic information, but a lot of people just don't know about it. So, I've noticed one thing on tattoos. No one ever gets one tattoo. It starts off on a journey. Same with books. No one ever writes one book. I, I've written three. Um, is this your final book? Or do you think there'll be another one down the road? No, there'll definitely be another one. See, did I did I not call that buster? 
And, and, you know, one of the chapters I really enjoyed writing in the first book was on emotional intelligence. And the more I heard, the more dealings I've had with some of my staff, talking to other doctors about their staff, there were so many other topics that I never even mentioned in the first book, such as... Now, I'm not talking about your office or my office. I've heard of other rumors maybe having employees that could be passive-aggressive. So I had to put a chapter on the passive-aggressive employee. We've never dealt with those, but I've heard rumors about that. Uh, what about the employee who is the victim? Everything, oh, she's, she's trying to, she's making me look bad. I, I, I entered the data correctly. I gave the wrong employment information. That's because someone, it was someone else's fault. So there's just so many more things about emotional intelligence I wanted to get out. And that's, I'm finishing that up right now. And hopefully by this summer that uh, the emotional intelligence dental office will be out. You know, when you, when you talk to someone at a party that's not in dentistry, they, they think a root canal is probably the most complicated thing we do. Um, and I always tell people that understanding how the human mind works is a hundred times more difficult than learning how to do a root canal. I mean, humans are so complex. Even at my age, I'm still amazed. Uh, it seems like the older and older I get, to realize, you realize how amazingly complex the human mind is. I mean, you can sit there, you can sit there and be with all your kids in one room and, and how they all went through, you know, was, uh, a waitress that came to the table and this person was upset. This person didn't care. This one, yeah, I mean, they're just, I mean, humans are just, they're just so complex. We're so out of time. I have to stop. Final question. Uh, I know you're a fan of the movie, the Godfather. What are, what are your favorite quotes from the Godfather that apply to a dental office? Well, I'm not going to say leave the gun, take the cannolis. I won't say that line. <laughs> but basically, you know, a couple of lines uh, that I really like using or think about, uh, especially when it comes to employees, uh, it's not personal, it's business. If an employee just isn't cutting the mustard, uh, you've coached them, you've canceled them, you're not being a bad guy making them accountable. You, so it, it's, not, it's not personal, it's business. And the other one I, I do, you know, to me, like, Endo, oral surgery, that's not my life. It, it provides me the things I can do uh, with my family. And I like the line, uh, basically, a man, I think Don Corleone said this to Johnny Fontaine, a man who doesn't spend time with his family isn't a real man. So it's really important for me to spend time with my family. We go on f uh, summer vacations together. Uh, we go to uh, a certain state uh, over Christmas every year. I won't mention that one. Uh, Hawaii. Hawaii. But uh, but we use but I use frequent flyer points. So yeah. that's the, oh yeah that's one of the other things about financial advice. Get points so you don't have to pay for those trips. Yeah, I knew uh, the funniest Hawaii story I have is when my little kid, the oldest one, Eric, he couldn't have been ten. We went to Hawaii, and all of a sudden this lady lets out this god awful scream. We're waiting to get into a restaurant. I look at this lady, and she's looking up, and there's like this fifty foot coconut tree, and Eric's up there, climbed up there, hanging on a branch, knocking coconuts off. Who would have guessed later he'd have been a rock climber? I mean, the guy just... Uh... It's funny talking about uh, the things our son's saying, and this has made me come down to earth. You know, we, we think we have offices, and we think, okay, just when we started thinking that we're, okay, we're very important. And I remember this is my... I never... I always repeat this story about my son, David, when he was two years old, and we were in front of a group of other parents, and he actually said, I, I want to be like my dad. I want to be like my dad. And I remember, like, for those, I'm actually thinking, wow, that's, that that's what it's all about. No joke. And someone said to him, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, I'd like the peak standing up. That, and that told me all I needed to know. <laughs> True story. Yeah, my boys say the sweetest things. They, they always say that I'm their, uh, I'm their, their, their man. Um, so if, if they want to do the Scottsdale Leadership and Coaching Center, I mean, is it like, is it like a one-day class? Is it like a three, three-day weekends? What, what, what is the, the format? All of the above, we're going to be starting up for office managers a series of five lectures on uh, office management leadership. Uh, we're also going to have like some one-day lectures on emotional intelligence. Any questions, only endo. You're already sending me the email about getting the free book, so ask me any questions about it. I can give you any more information about it. 
Well, you know, one of the best things the Pink Institute did for marketing is they have uh, four one-week classes. Mm -hmm. So it's a big stretch to go from a, an ad in Dental Town Magazine to canceling production for a week, flying to Key Biscayne, Florida, and going through a week. So what I told them to do, and they did, and it was very successful, I said, well, just condense the whole week into one hour. And they made four one-hour courses corresponding to each one of their weeks, and I, I hope you do that. I think it'll be um, I think it'll be great marketing on your side. And again, these millennials, I think a lot of times the millennials before they go commit to go spend time away with someone, they, they like to see them, they like to hear them, they like to see if they're on YouTube before you know. So they know. So it it disintermediates. It's too big a leap from flyer to go to Scottsdale. So it's kind of an intermediate step. Give a, give them an hour online C course on Dental Town, and I think. Uh, uh, the more I can vouch that, the more you get to know this guy, the more you're going to love him. Dr. H, thank you so much well, for th coming over to Thank you for having me. It was an honor.